A naval training center is a big Navy town where green recruits are changed quickly into smart stepping companies of future shipmates. Where today, the Navy is turning out the Blue Jackets who will man its bases, sail its ships, fly in its planes tomorrow. We were green, all right. Just as green as recruits come from cities, small towns, farms all over the land. A little bit uncertain, too, when we walked down that road that led into the future. We told the yeoman who we were and where we came from. We were really in the Navy now, but we felt along. We quickly discovered the Navy's vigilance over a man's physical fitness. The Navy settles for nothing less than top shape to get us there, to keep us there. When we received the makings of a sea bag, we began to feel a little more Navy. Almost $200 worth of clothing, free to us. Skivvies, that's undershirts, whites, blues, shoes, from head to toe. No doubt about it, we joined the Navy. This was it. With our names on our uniforms and our pictures on our identification cards, we belonged. We were a company now, but a name only. We were assigned to barracks, our new home. And we met our company commander, Chief Clinton, who was going to make sailors out of us. Although he knew then, better than we, that it would take a lot of doing. Even in his first talk, he set us to thinking about things that get you ahead in the Navy. Ambition, self-confidence, self-respect. He was on our side, sort of leading the way for us, helping us feel more at home. He showed us the Navy way of doing things. There were little tricks to everything. We soon found out the chief was more than our leader. He was a friend, almost a father. Questions got straight answers. With 16 years in the Navy, he knew his way around. Jimmy Lane was lucky that first day. Had a letter from his girl waiting for him. And a picture, too our company's first pinup. Those of us with no mail yet took a wide-eyed look at our own training center news. There was certainly a lot of interesting things going on. After supper, we followed the chief's advice about cleanliness. We thought we were tired that night. We didn't even know then what tired meant, but we were to find out tomorrow. Navy days begin bright and early. By morning colors at 8 o'clock, everyone had been up for two and a half busy hours. The flag, as a symbol of the country we serve, gets treated with due ceremony in the Navy. We watched a sight that fills every Navy man with pride, a sensation we'd never quite known as yesterday's civilians, a sort of inner satisfaction that comes to men who have chosen careers of serving their country. That morning brought an introduction to the grinder. That's what recruits call the drill field. Oh, this wasn't our company yet. These men knew what they were doing. They had already learned the what's and why's of military drill, how it trains men to respond quickly to orders and to coordinate themselves with their shipmates. In short, to move like a smooth running machine. We didn't look at all like a machine. Well, we weren't. We were just a bunch of landlubbers in uniform out for a little stroll. Couldn't even keep in step at first. Weren't used to being one coordinated part of 110. This was the grinder. This was a grind, hard, tough training. Chief Clinton had more patience than we had, teaching us to halt on the one, two, and to no left from right. Right face. Left face, 
About face. <laughs> You'd get all mixed up, feel a little foolish, but it all had a purpose, and it was a challenge to do it right. We began slowly to improve, to fall into the automatic rhythm. Of course, every once in a while, the chief spotted somebody out of step, but that happened less and less often. We began to admit it to ourselves. We were getting good. Even the chief was becoming proud of us. He said we had a good chance to win the regimental E flag for the best drilling company, and that meant extra liberty. And there was another good thing about Navy life. It certainly gave you an appetite. The cooks were experts at their art, although we had some galley drill too. Good old potatoes. Navy food may not be served fancy, but it's how it tastes that counts. And that steak was out of this world. There was plenty of book learning, and the chief knew most of the books by heart. Knew a lot of things that weren't in the books, too. This was a real education, and we earned while we learned. Finding out about rates and pay grades, and where we were going in this man's Navy. The Navy sets its standards high. That was fine with us. But we were all thinking more and more about the bright prospects of a Navy career. From the document we called Rocks and Shoals, we learned our naval right and wrong. Developing a company spirit. We were now shipmates, learning together. And we wanted to know all about ships, which was a big order, even for the chief who taught us our seamanship quite away from the sea. This is the port anchor chain and shackle, he said. And this is the starboard. And we repeated it to ourselves. A new language, this nautical lingo, and we liked it. This was practical, basic, real. Learn how to rig up a block and tackle, and the pulleys give you what's called a mechanical advantage. Polite for taking the strain off your back. Sometimes a fellow's imagination could carry him away until suddenly he remembered he was still in a classroom learning how things worked. With a growing zest to get aboard a real seagoing ship on a day still months away. This came first, knowing the difference between the quarterdeck and the bridge, cleats and bits, lines and halyards, decks and bulkheads, hundreds of terms. We like to pretend there was a ship actually responding to the dummy controls, because someday there would be engines and rudders on the other end. We learned more on the full-size model of the real thing. We looked ahead to 20 or 30 years filled with ships, from landing craft to battleships. Still, for fellows who were landlubbers last month, we were making progress. A rope's not a rope, it's a line, and knots and hitches come in handy. A good knot is a work of art. A bowline, for instance. Looper. Bring the free end up and through. Around. Back down and through. And it's a loop that won't slip. The application of this knowledge was just around the corner the next day when we took to the water. Our seamanship training was vital to us here. This was not the ocean, but it was water, and that was a beginning. Some of us had never been in a boat, but in our determination to learn, we ignored our ignorance. The coxswain gave us the stroke, and soon we were making her move. In perfect timing with his commands, we were a team united in a common effort with complete confidence in our proficiency afloat. We were getting confidence in the water, too. Many of us couldn't even dog paddle. But, as in everything else, 
The Navy knew how to teach us swimming in no time at all, and soon we were at home in the water, and happy to have mastered one more subject. We learned a few things about marksmanship under the expert instruction of our friends, the Marines. Hold your breath. Squeeze the trigger. And, well, complete misses at first. But here was the story of our training in a nutshell. Practice and perseverance led to bullseyes. It was no lark, but the Marines had patience and we had a will to learn, to become proficient in everything a Blue Jacket must know. Training films were a pleasant way to soak up knowledge. The motion pictures were especially designed for us. It all tied in. We would see a film on gunnery, and pick right up where the picture left off, with the real thing, like this 40 millimeter AA. And again, we were reminded that just about everything a man does with his shipmates calls for precision teamwork and coordination. Working or playing. To the Navy, our play was just as important as our work, to relax us, to get us and keep us in top shape. And we always had our mascot, Mr. Bones, on hand for luck. We'd often get in a good workout in the morning. Or sharpen up, toughen ourselves for Saturday's game. It was all a part of getting fit and keeping fit. This was supposed to be work, but you couldn't convince us. Knowing how to handle your fists doesn't hurt your self-reliance one bit. No black eyes today. We were getting harder, better able to take it, doing everything together. We even saved our earnings together, and it was a good habit to form, particularly when you'd found a purpose in your future. Our leftover pay sometimes ended up at the ship's store, where you could buy radios, fountain pens, candy, even a gold wristwatch for Mom's birthday. Friday night usually meant a dance, which was held in the big reception building. As usual, admission was free. Next morning, we were up before Reveille, swabbing down our barracks deck, which we used to call a floor, and making ready for the captain's inspection. It was worth getting up early to get things shipshape. We wanted to win the rooster flag that went to the top company at inspection. We'd won it last Saturday, and we were out to make it a permanent fixture. That afternoon came the big football game of the season, and we were all on hand. One of our boys had made first team halfback. From the opening play, we stopped them in their tracks. We did more than play as a team. We lived as a team. Afterwards, we headed for our favorite meeting place, the recreation building. We celebrated our victory and hashed over the afternoon's passes, punts, and prayers. There was plenty to talk about. Our own man was the pride of our company for scoring the winning touchdown. Sunday morning, services were held for each denomination, and recruits were encouraged to follow the religion of their own choice. After services, we'd often meet the chaplain, who helped us with many personal problems, a staunch friend. On Sunday afternoon, the visitors would come, parents, kid brothers and sisters, and maybe your best girl. We'd meet them all at the reception building. 
It was like home to kiss mom hello again and introduce her to your shipmate. She enjoyed knowing how her sailor son was getting along. It wasn't at all hard to swing back into the routine on Monday morning when the work was as exciting as firefighting drill. We got the feel of it on the little blazes first, armed with our protective clothing and high pressure fog nozzles. And when we'd learned the principles involved, we graduated to bigger fires, like this one in a replica of a ship's superstructure. Finally, when we'd become expert firefighters, we'd take on big stubborn blazes like this. We were in there putting them out the hard way, from the leeward side. Sure, our faces got dirty, but we didn't mind at all. This was the way to learn, by doing. And this was the way we learned what we were going to do in the Navy, our aptitude test, where we were asked about our hobbies, our aims in life, what sort of work appealed to us. And it was all climaxed by quizzes that helped us locate our proper niche. No square pegs and round holes here. The Navy took every care to start us off right. And among 80 skilled jobs, we'd all found one we liked. Aviation machinists keep the Navy flying. Motor machinists keep the engines repaired. Ship fitters work with giant hydraulic presses. Metalsmiths perform miracles with steel. Machinists operate lathes and machine tools. Electricians produce the Navy's power. And electronics men work on radio and radar sets. Radio men keep the Navy in contact with itself. Radar men work at the forefront of science. There are specialists in aerial photography, motion pictures, news photos of Navy events. Yeomen handle the Navy's paperwork. Hospital men care for the sick, assist the doctors, act as pharmacists. Signalmen handle short-range communication. Quartermasters assist in navigation. And some men acquire special ratings and get extra pay. Almost any job you can name, you'll find in the United States Navy. This was more than just another Saturday review. It was graduation day. We had learned the fundamentals of a great career and the simple truth that by working for his shipmates, a man promotes his own good. As we marched past the reviewing stand, we knew the Commodore would recognize us. We were the company carrying the regimental E flag last six weeks in a row. No longer were we youths with few responsibilities, but men with a purpose in life, prepared to meet the future. Tom Ross was going out to basic submarine school. The future was no longer uncertain. It was here. Scotty Hale to Aviation Fundamental School. Bill Johnson, tomorrow's electronics technician. We were filled with assurance and confidence, and a pride in ourselves, in the Navy, in the uniforms we wore. Our discipline, our teamwork were part of us now thanks to Chief Clinton, the proudest of us all. After our recruit leave, all our new lives would be awaiting us at our next stations, schools, and ships. Yes, this was the same gate we had entered three short months before, but we were not the same men. Inside that gate, we had found ourselves, found a future. Out there on every ocean of the earth, the Navy was ready to take us aboard. And now we were ready to go.